Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today with the Professor Hamamoto channel. We're here today on November 19th, 2020 at the 11 a.m. hour on Thursday with Howard Lon Wilson. And we go back many, many years. And today we're going to devote ourselves to a conversation on a, a quite serious topic, uh, an incident that looms quite large in American, if not world history. And the anniversary is coming up soon, uh, November 22nd, 1963, at 12.30 PM Central Standard Time, our beloved President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was struck down by an assassin's bullet. And today, Howard L. Wilson from Orange County will be sharing with us his memories, his vivid memories of that time. We were the same age, we were in the same class, we were living in the same social cultural milieu in Anaheim, California. In fact, Howard, if you could begin this conversation with a brief overview of how we met each other, when we met each other, and then we can launch into the Kennedy assassination memories that you have. And I always admired you for your acute recall of the, the most minute detail. So I'm really looking forward to this and it's gonna take all the willpower I have in my command to keep silent as you share your your memories. Howard? Okay, Daryl, you can, you can pop in anytime in case I make a mistake. Uh, you and I met uh, at Brookers Junior High School in Anaheim in the fall of 1965. <laughs> we were both in seventh grade uh we had one or two classes together english i believe and then um in the second semester early in 66 that uh i as a bassoon player joined the intermediate band under the auspices of the great Farrell j spencer you were on the clarinet i was on the bassoon and that's where we got to know each other a little bit better and then uh to be when we became friends though actually right in senior year uh when we were in the on the Savannah Dispatch at Savannah High School in Anaheim. Uh, we were both columnists uh, on that paper and reporters, and that's when we became really good friends. Uh, beyond that, then you introduced me to a lot of jazz and blues, and we would drive to the Ash Grove in uh, Los Angeles and see the likes of Lightning Hopkins and uh, Big Joe Williams and Buddy Guy. And uh, friendship uh, went on from there for years and years and years. Great, wow. Yeah, you bring back the memories of the Ashgrove with the great uh, T-Bone Walker as well. That's right. Your Kane Harris, right? All the people that were then associated with the Johnny Otis band. Yeah. Who had That's been right. big during our father's time. Yes. You know, as they were growing up. Because my father said, oh, you saw T-Bone Walker? I used to go see him at the Million Dollar Theater in downtown L.A. Yeah. So it's kind of a cross generational, and that's really what we're doing here. We want to pass yes. on the cross transgenerational memory of this uh, assassination. So, could you get into the specifics? Where were you on that fateful day, Howard? I was at Oro Grande Elementary School in Buena Park, California, and uh, in the fifth grade, it was uh, we were, we had had lunch. We were out on the playground and uh, just running around. Now, at the time. In fifth grade, that's when you learn. Uh, it's generally it's uh, your your social studies are, are uh, generally America focused. So we were learning about uh, not only the geography of this of the U.S. but the history. And I think by November we were probably in uh, revolutionary or post revolutionary times. Now, I'd always been interested in history, even a little kid. Uh, and this might be a digression, but. At six years old, going to Tombstone with my family, and seeing all these things that I saw on TV by watching uh, *Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp*. So I was really interested in history anyway. So I'm learning about U.S. history, and I'm thinking, "Wow, these these people were living in historical times. I mean, there were people here who were there during the Revolution or the War of 1812 or whatever." And I think, "Wow, and nothing ever historical happens around me in my day." <laughs> so you know, that's kind of my attitude at the at the time. So I'm out here on the playground. At, uh, at Oro Grande Elementary School. And all of a sudden they say, okay, everybody has to come in. Come in for why? They put us in our classroom, they bring the TV set in. And all of a sudden we've got Huntley and Brinkley uh, 
on the tube and they're saying there's been an incident in Dallas, Texas, President uh, Kennedy has been shot. And we're going, what the hell's going on? Some girls are crying and it's just, and then after a few minutes they say, it is official now, President Kennedy is dead. And we're going, somebody shot the president? I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, we read about Abraham Lincoln or Garfield and stuff, but that's all historical stuff. I think, wow, I'm living in a historical time right now. And it was just an amazing thing that uh, here we are watching this, this incident occur right in our lives. And that, that, that impressed me as much as the fact that what's going to happen next, you know, uh, knowing about president's succession, you know, said, okay, we know now that, that, uh, that uh, Johnson is going to be president. And then the next in line is the speaker of the house and, you know, that kind of stuff, because our teacher telling us all that right away, just in case, you know, Johnson has a heart attack or something. Um, and then, so I go home and uh, I've got a cousin staying with us and she's just staring at the TV set saying, I don't, what's going on here? And then my dad happens to be home at the time. And he, the first thing, one of the first things he says is that I think Johnson's behind it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't think much of that. I mean, it, it seemed kind of unlikely. And then, uh, then that, that whole weekend is just everything shut down. It's, um, it's just an amazing thing. The next day or on Sunday, I'm over at a neighbor's house and we're just playing, you know, Chinese checkers or something. And then, uh, and we're kind of glancing at the TV every once in a while and they're bringing um, Oswald, he's in the basement at the, in, in Dallas, Texas. And all of a sudden this guy comes in and shoots him right on TV. And they go, what? You know, this isn't the untouchables. This is something that's really happening. And it's one more just insane thing that's happening. And, uh, you know, that's what at least they have the news because uh, otherwise, how are we going to see this stuff? And so then I, we go home and my old man's saying, OK, yeah, he's he sure that Johnson had Ruby kill Oswald or something. So that was the very first conspiracy theory I ever heard about the, about the uh, Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln, sorry, Kennedy assassination. Now, Howard, and, let me uh, break in a moment. Yes, go right now, ahead. Your, fa your, your father was a great man. Tony is, was his yeah. name. Really sweet, yeah. sweet gentleman. And your mother, Fran. These were two uh, parents who I were not. I was not scared of. Most when you're a kid, you're kind of frightened yeah. of other people's parents, but they were so warm and welcoming. And I can remember many uh, an evening till midnight, being in your living room listening to to our mu our music, right? Joni yeah. Mitchell, Blue, late at night, and they were fine with it. They let us, you know, have our have our fun. Sure. But your father, uh, like mine, had you know been uh, way outside of his his neighborhood. And he was he was a combat veteran of World War II, yeah. so he had some some understanding of the wider world that, that we were insulated from. I think they were probably trying to protect us. That's my guess. So, given that background, and and that's that's really prescient uh, of your father to come out mm -hmm. with that, because there have been a couple of books, at least two, at least that have pointed to LBJ and Lyndon Baines Johnson, is, uh, Johnson rather, as being behind the assassination. So what do you think from your adult perspective that your father, where he was coming from so far as pointing the finger at Johnson? Um, it's kind of hard to say exactly. Uh, he just thought it was too much of a setup, I suppose. It was in Texas. Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is Johnson's home state. Uh, and that Johnson, you know, he thought Johnson was kind of a slimy character to begin with. Uh, I, you know, he, uh, my dad was a Democrat and he liked Kennedy uh, for the most part. Um, and uh, I don't think he cared much for Johnson because I do believe that, uh, in fact, I can say for certain that in 1964, he voted for uh, Barry Goldwater. So, and it might have been more that he disliked johnson that he cared that much for goldwater so i think it just might have been some antipathy towards johnson that, he went, that i never really heard any explanation for okay so well, excuse me for interrupting but i, I just thought that was a no a right brilliant ahead. call <laughs> like way decades ahead of his time because it sure it looks like that might it might be indeed the case that that uh, johnson was involved in some capacity mm -hmm. so please continue okay um Beyond that, then uh, after a while, I didn't really pay that close attention. I, you know, I just assumed that Oswald was the assassin. And then there was a period of time when more and more things like, uh, what was that, Garrison in Louisiana? Was that his name? What was the name of that? Uh, yes, uh, Jim Garrison. 
Jim Garrison uh, right. from Louisiana was uh, first coming up with uh, his um, uh, his take on the assassination, uh, followed by then there was a, a, a myriad of books. Probably you could fill a whole bookcase with books on the uh, people's theories on it. Um, there was uh, that book that was published uh, in the I believe it was in the 70s, uh, and it showed uh, actual pictures of Kennedy lying you know, on his, uh, you know, his, his body with the head blown off and have shocking pictures of that that were withheld for years. Um, and then there was a theory saying that the Kennedys were involved, not so much in the, in the murder, but in the cover up because they didn't want people to know the physical condition of the president with, um, his Bright's disease and his, and his gonorrhea and all the other incurable gonorrhea and things that Kennedy's helped increase, increase the muddle by their involvement in trying to cover up his physical condition because he was not a healthy man when he was murdered uh and then uh yeah but anyway there was all kinds of books and i was thinking about all these different theories on what the assassination was the the grassy knoll and the, and the second gunman and things but at some point i started becoming more skeptical of the skeptics than i was of the warren report and even now i have a tendency to think that assassination was just a, a lone uh, fanatic who had already tried to assassinate a, a, an American general, and that was Lee Oswald. The, and I read there was a book by Gerald Posner called um, Case Closed, which I read, and which seemed to make sense to me that it was just a matter, you know, of that Oswald, who was a, who was a communist, um, had intended to kill the president, who was, you know, an anti-communist. Uh, a, a cold warrior, so to speak, uh, and that that was he, that was the motivation right there. Um, and there were also been books from the right saying that Castro was behind the assassination. Um, so, without getting too involved in the story, um, I had come to the conclusion, and I pretty much still feel that way, that it was just a, a case of a of a, uh, a guy, a real seriously sociopathic guy, Lee Oswald, who committed the assassination and. All, all the luck was in his way to be able to get the job at, uh, at the uh, book depository. Kennedy recklessly going past uh, these tall buildings without a shield over the uh, over this limousine. I mean, face it, Kennedy was a reckless guy. Uh, and just thinking that it just turned out that he just had the opportunity and took it. And that's pretty much how I'm thinking now. I don't really, I haven't followed all the conspiracy theories, but I'm I'm fairly certain, at least in my mind, that it was just a, a, a lone gunman. Okay, fair enough. Um, we can perhaps return to Lee Harvey also the latter part of the conversation. But sure. Can we go back to the the mood of the Wilson household? While this, oh, sure. Because it was all just, all the networks were, were, were doing Kennedy-related aftermath. And remember, ladies right. and gentlemen, there was no cable TV. It was right. local, a couple of local stations, and the three major networks right so the networks were entirely up? entirely uh uh 24 hour uh coverage of every aspect of the assassination with cronkite on two huntley and brinkley on four nobody remembers who was on seven <laughs> abc the third network uh and then the actually the the um local channels were covering it too from a local perspective talking to local people about it except there was one channel i believe it was channel 13 it was probably the the least watch uh, station uh, in the LA Orange County uh, market that was showing continuously over and over again, the film, um, The Miracle of Our Lady of Fatima, which oh. is probably the only real Catholic centered film that they had in their library. So they were just, they just ran that endlessly over and over again. So got to watch that and, and remember how, well, never mind, how cute no, Sherry no. Jackson was in that. <laughs> well, no, that's, that's an interesting uh, detail. KCOP, yeah, KCOP, is that the call KCOP, letters? KCOP, yeah. My channel 13. Yeah. yeah, it was owned by Chris Craft, the, uh, the, uh, right. the people who used to make, uh, you know, boats. That was their, uh, their loss leader, probably. Apparently, Chris Craft had some very deep state uh, connections. Didn't know that. And their their name was it came up in the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination amongst the different conspiracies. So maybe there was... Yeah. Some meaning there by running the miracle of Fatima over and over again. Maybe it was a taunt. Yeah. To the Catholic oh, community. Now, wow. um, 
were your parents Protestants? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not practicing Protestants. My mother uh, was a Presbyterian and my father a Methodist. Not that we ever went to church more than, whoa. We're, whoops. <laughs> okay, no, 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 no. What do I do next? We're still on. I can hear okay. you. Your camera went off, though. Yeah, what happened is the little suction cup on the bottom of my holder oh. just slipped. Can I get back? Uh, oh, oh, you're okay. back. You're back. Perfect. Hey. No, no. Th the reason that I ask about the religion is this. Uh, I don't know if you recall this, but there was a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment back then. Yeah, and one of the issues about religion. Kennedy was that he was Catholic. Yeah, that was true. In fact, there was some non stuff going on about it. Um, it's, uh, there's a, um, a story I've written is about uh, uh, this kid, actually based on something that really happened. I was at a, a bowling alley uh, children's, um, you know, where they, the nursery, I suppose you could call it, for kids go where their parents are in the lanes. And uh, there was this kid who, um, a couple, I was about, I was a fifth grader. He was like a sixth grader or something or whatever. Uh, he was talking about how he wanted to be a priest and started giving me the creed in Latin. And then he asked me, uh, are you Catholic? I said, no. Um, but, uh, you know, I have nothing against Catholics. And he said, a lot of people don't like Catholics. And it was true. I just remember there was anti Catholic sentiment going along. Uh, but, uh, you know, I gave it some consideration and I, you know, yes, I said, well, my dad sometimes talks about Catholics, but he voted for president Kennedy. So obviously, uh, it doesn't mean that much to him. It was just, you know, typical snide you know, <laughs> bigotry that people will have, and yet they don't practice it in real life, you know? Right. No, was that at the Lindbrook bowl? Uh, no, the Anaheim bowl. Oh, great. See, I want the details where Fedco used to be or FedMart or something. Where, yeah, right by, right by FedMart. Yeah, or maybe yeah, right in that general area. Yeah, the Anaheim right. Bowl, the big, uh, the big A. That was the original big A before they built An Anaheim Stadium. That's right. This, we're talking about 1963, ladies and gentlemen, Anaheim, yes. California, when we were living under the cloud, not only the nuclear cloud, but the cloud of Walt Disney. And we had the, uh, and every night we had had the fireworks. Uh, something that I, something that I miss now because of the Disneyland being closed. I mean, it's like, it's 20 minutes to nine. Where are the fireworks? Yeah. But yeah, that was it uh, growing up in Anaheim. And um, anyway, getting back to the, the, the mood of the time um, that, yeah, there really wasn't much said about Catholics then. I mean, I went to school with Catholics. I went to a, a school that were, uh, Lots of Catholics, lots of Jewish kids. We all just kind of lived together and nobody gave much thought about it, um, about that aspect of it. Uh, in Buena Park, there was uh, St. Pius V uh, school and I knew a lot of kids, they went to church there and then occasionally there were kids in the neighborhood who went to St. Pius uh, school. And you just knew the kids, oh yeah, that was the, those are the Logans, there's 12 in their family. And uh, the kid at the bowling alley once, you know, he said, I tell him he had a little sister with him and, and, he, and I mentioned I had, there were six of us. He says, "You got six kids, and you're and you're not Catholics." <laughs> but uh, 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 yeah, it just happened that way. But yeah, there was yeah, there were just these like families in the neighborhood, and you just uh, said, "Okay, well, you know, everybody has their own beliefs." There was an interesting thing. Speaking of which, there was a, a Catholic family a couple of doors down, the the Opitzes, and one little kid. He was maybe a third grader, and he, uh, he was just a. a just absolutely obsessed with John Kennedy. I mean, he just thought John Kennedy was the second coming. And after the assassination, he went into a deep funk and he, he would get one of those life magazines that shows the life of Kennedy. And he was saying, look at these pictures, look at these pictures. And it shows pictures of, um, you know, John and uh, uh, John and Jackie and, and uh, Caroline and JJ, John Jr. With John John, that's what they call John, it. John John, yeah. John John, yeah. Uh, you know, on the beach, these, these kind of posed pictures on the beach at Hyannisport, you know, that you knew that, uh, that generally as soon as he got done there, he went off to some motel with a, ho with a, with a hooker, but still, you know, all these sort of warm family pictures on the, you know, uh, sailing uh, in the Bay of Hyannisport. Uh, and he said, look at this wonderful family. Look what happened to them. And we go, well, okay, gee, yeah, that's real sad, uh, Mark. It's just, uh, you know, it's just that sort of thing. Yeah, you know, and we're really sorry to see that. And then of course, as schoolboys are, you know, you start getting cynical about these things. And at the time, there was this game called Fascination by, made by Rimko. Rim, fascination, Rimko Fascination. So some mm -hmm. wag of a kid came up with the idea to start talking about a game called Assassination. Oh. Uh, assassination, Kennedy Assassination. And this Mark kid just, just burst into tears, would run away and hide whenever people start joking about it. You can't joke about that. 
And of course, you know, well, there was my. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Back Maybe again. That... Okay. Back again. Yeah, this suction cup maybe just can't hold my phone. Yeah. Too, but, yeah all right. If you prop it up, you'll be okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's a really good in, uh, insight into the sensitivity, even amongst fifth graders. Yeah. Right? How old would we be? Like 10 or something? 10 or uh, Yeah, 10. Yeah, we turned 11 a little bit later in the year. You know, after yeah, the we, weren't, we weren't even teenagers at the time. No. Now, let me ask you about your, your parents. Uh, yes. What was their mood? Because it was like nonstop coverage. And surely it must have been a shock for them, even though they had gone through the Depression and World War II. Is it right? Uh, what was what was the mood there at the Wilson household? It was somber. It was somber. Um, it's uh, uh, you know it was leading up to Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving was the following Thursday. So, but I think uh, it wasn't too long that things just had to go back to normal. Uh, you know, we would see. You know, there was the time. You know, they've watched the, over and over again of Johnson saying, we have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. And, you know, you'd see that over and over again. But after a while, they would kind of phase out. And then at the end of the year, they started recapping the events of 63 and always focusing on the assassination. But I think after, eventually, like everybody else, you know, life goes on. So my mom and dad, uh, you know, they stopped talking about it. And eventually new things came out because right after the first of the year was I want to hold your hand. And all of us kids were obsessed with the Beatles going to, you know, JJ Newberry's and buying Beatle cards kind of things. So it's just mm -hmm. one thing at least to another. And every once in a while you go back to it. But yeah, my parents' mood was probably somber if I remember much about it, but then it passed like mm -hmm. any other, you know, big bad event. Okay. Uh, my dad, uh, if he would talk about it occasionally, he'd probably just trot out his Johnson theory. Uh, and, you know, and then, uh, but then, um, you know, three years later, it was the 25th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And so all of a sudden he's talking about that or whatever else, the struggle that he lived through. Mm -hmm. And and then, so yeah, essentially it was a somber mood that gave way to life goes on. Mm -hmm. Now you alluded briefly to the Beatles coming in that time. Yeah. Some people have speculated that that, that was the timing was not entirely accidental that they were brought in in order to take us away from the, the national Yeah, I, I don't comment? really subscribe to that theory at all. I just thought it was just, you know, they, they came at a time uh, when it was a watershed time and they came in with something new, which wasn't really new. It was just something American that they had anglicized. Uh, and they just, uh, you know, because they caught over on in England before they came over here. And, uh, you know, they're huge in England. And sooner or later, somebody was going to get the idea that, well, they might be just as popular here. Kids may be ready for this sort of thing after, uh, you know, uh, a little bit too long of the, uh, the Fabians and the Frankie Avalons and that kind of stuff. And just something new. And uh, like any other craze, like Pokemon, it's just you don't know what, what's going to happen. All of a sudden, it's big. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and so 20 years ago, it was Pokemon. And. 55 years ago, it was John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Mm -hmm. And very well, welcome, as it was. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm glad you know the your Beatles history. They just didn't pop out of anywhere. They had been together for a number of years before yeah. they even broke in Britain, let alone yes. America, because that's one of the, the quote-unquote conspiracy theories that's kind of tied in with the JFK theories, that they're all of a piece. They're all part of a larger deep state. Yeah. You know, yeah. And um, let, let me ask you how you, because you, you hinted at earlier that you had read these books and you were thinking along these more conspiratorial lines. Mm -hmm. How did you come back to the, the other position? Because I agree with you, a lot of this material that came out um, is disinformation. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these books and, and, and people have said that Posner himself was a, a disinfo artist. So what was your progression because i know you've always been a heavy reader you had older brothers who were in college and brought all the adult books home and we could you know you would share <laughs> them and they'd you know you introduced me to jd salinger through right. your older brother who was in college and i go wow I'll catch you on the right it turns out later hinkley was that was his kind of trigger book and then we find out that jd salinger himself was a um intelligence officer in world war ii yeah in i mean he might have crossed paths with your father they're around the same age and the yeah. same location. 
Yeah, he helped highly to, possible. He helped to exfiltrate all those Nazis that came in after the war. Not all of them, but he helped. He profiled them along with Henry Kissinger, people like that, and brought them yeah. over as part of NASA. So we were reading this material. We were exposed to it, but we didn't yeah. know what the agenda was. So can you perhaps the, extrapolate backwards? Yeah, I think it was just probably because it was a, the entire cottage industry. So I just started getting skeptical of just about anything that came up. There was this movie that came out about 1973. Yeah, I would think it was 73, a movie called, um, what was that called? Oh my God, now, see, now the memory's starting to fade. Uh, Executive, Executive Order? Action. Executive Action. action. With Burt yeah, Lancaster and, had, uh, Robert, and Ryan. Robert Ryan. Robert, Robert Ryan played kind of a, a, a Texas millionaire. Uh, and uh, it uh, gave their theory on the assassination that Oswald was a plant. And uh, the, it kind of took all of the garrison and everything else all into one, um, one little boat, just to make a dramatic film. And uh, it actually, I think it included some footage from Zapruder. And the um, uh, the net result. And then at the very end of it, they ran this uh, sort of um, uh, po after film of thing that's listing all the names of all the people who died mysteriously, uh, at least mysteriously, it's in their minds that were somewhere right. or other possibly connected with the Kennedy assassination, like Dorothy Kilgallen and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, well, that's that's kind of interesting. I wonder, I, but I started even then getting skeptical. I wonder how accurate that is. If, if Dorothy Kilgallen just just happened to have a pill problem and ended up, you know, taking a, an accidental overdose, because you know that does happen even with people not associated with the Kennedy assassination. And Say that again. It does happen. People take accidental overdoses that oh. that you know had no connection whatsoever. Okay. With that, not every person who dies of an accidental overdose. Uh, is being killed because of knowledge of some conspiracy. Okay. And for so, the younger people, who was Dorothy Kilgallen? Dorothy Kilgallen was a columnist, uh, a kind of a, 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 a celebrity columnist. Uh, she would write columns about celebrities. And she was a regular, there was a TV show that ran for like 20 years called uh, What's My Line? And the game was if somebody would come on the show and the series of questions that this four person panel would ask would be able to determine what this person's occupation was. Extremely popular show. And there were uh, at least two, uh, three people on the poll. There were regular panelists and then have a guest panelist. Bennett Cerf, who was a publisher for Random House. Um, and then a, 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 a Ann, what was her name? Uh, an actress, a stage actress, and then Dorothy Kilgallen, a columnist. And they were regulars. And so they became celebrities in their own right, just because they were on this five nights a week uh, uh, game show. So anyway, that was Dorothy Kilgallen. And she, and I can't remember exactly what her connection was, but she uh, allegedly had some insight into uh, in the assassination conspiracy. And some not long after that, she had died of a drug overdose. And uh, people had attempted to make a connection between her accidental death and uh, the Kennedy assassination. So that okay. was an example of, of one of the people that was listed. All right, so she was a major celebrity of the day. A major celebrity, day. yes. So if she died, there would be questions raised in the public eye. By the way, have you read the couple of books on Dorothy Kilgallen that have come out in the last couple of years? No, as a matter of fact, I hadn't. Oh, okay. Because um, you, you recount it uh, quite accurately, but um, uh, and, and of course these people, uh, understandably, are more inclined to believe that she was the the victim of some sort of uh, hit. Because I don't know if you remember this, and I, I certainly don't as a child, because I, I I only knew Dorothy Kilgallen as that woman on that TV show. What's my line, yeah. right? I didn't yeah. know that she was a part of the. New York literary, intellectual, and journalistic establishment, and knew oh, people okay. in high places, and was connected to the Kennedys and had access in inside. I just thought she was mm. a TV, you know, personality. Which yeah, you, yeah, you just take them as entertainers. Sure. But um, uh, there's a, a great deal that's been uh, published about her uh, recently, and um, it turns out that uh, in her time, she was considered to be. Um, a, a quite credible, highly ranked, and um, 
valued journalist amongst other journalists, amongst mm. other professional journalists. So there's these always there's these new bits of information and, and interpreting and his, historical information that's helping to uh, understand this, uh, this episode. Now, let me ask you this, Howard, do you think that, uh, you know, we returned to normal, the Beatles came in and yeah. uh, baseball championships, uh, playoffs came and went and people went on with their lives. But what do you think the long term, the lasting effect of the Kennedy assassination has been for the for the American public? Even for those who have no direct memory of it? Like yeah, well, it, it introduced a, a, um, a it, it heightened the awareness of how one incident can change the direction of a country. So at the time, I mean, and there was a lot going on in there because you had the civil rights movement, uh, the Vietnam War was starting to kick up. So things just got more, more and more turbulent as the 60s went on. In fact, I remember uh, many years later, uh, there was this girl who would use the expression, oh, don't go all 60s on me. The 60s, at least in the, in the ensuing decades, would look back as a period of great turmoil. And I can imagine that uh, sometime in the future, say, man, I was all 2020 over that whole thing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was a time of great uh, turmoil. And I think people were starting to get a little bit suspicious about what was causing all this turmoil. Because up until that time, you know, yeah. I mean, if you go back to the election of 1960, uh, Kennedy and Nixon were friends. I mean, they had spent time, you know, going, uh, going on lecture tours together. They were really good friends. In fact, even after the assassination, now the uh, the election kind of broke up their friendship, but Kennedy and Jackie remained. I mean, rather Nixon and Jackie remained friends for a long time afterwards. In fact, this is really little known. Hmm. After the assassination, uh, Johnson pretty much turned his back on the Kennedys, and it wasn't until early in 1969 when Nixon took the White House that Jackie and her kids were returned to the White House, and there were guests of the Nixon there for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, these there were things were really smooth, fairly smooth between the parties. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have um, uh, people. You didn't have uh, like give an example. Uh, Stevenson going on and on about what a horrible person that Eisenhower was. It was all pretty smooth going up until that point, and then the assassination and all the because if you look at the election of '64, Johnson's in office. And these scurrilous anti-Goldwater ad television ads were being run. And I think so the whole temper changed and there was more and more of that going on as the years went by. It's it smoothed out a little bit in the uh, 70s and 80s, but now you see what it's like now. Mm -hmm. So I think that one of the legacies of the assassination uh, and Watergate, which is another you know major change, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we have the situation where it is now, which is nothing like it probably was uh in the in the all the times you know maybe in the, the all of the 20th century leading up to the assassination mm -hmm. well That's you it. you know you and i both grew up in orange county which was mm -hmm. in in the national media they would make fun of it on the johnny carson show tonight show orange yeah. county and and the friends that i had later on who lived in the west side of la santa monica west of the 405 freeway with where the liberals still congregate and yeah, over Santa Monica, exactly. Venice and you know uh, West LA and Brentwood and all. Yeah, uh, you know the limousine, limousine liberal type people, yes. right? Uh, they would always stigmatize us as being these conspiracy John Bircher type people. Do you remember that? You yeah, know we, we allegedly lived behind the orange curtain. Go on from that, please. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we were, uh, and the thing was, during this period of time, I mean, I went through a. A radical period, uh, starting like in you know in in uh, uh, high school. I was a high school radical, getting in trouble because of my leftist beliefs. <laughs> and uh, to me, I, I it, looking back on it now, I think it was all sex related. But that's something that's different, entirely <laughs> different. <laughs> yeah, to me, there was probably going to be more sex on the left than on the right. But anyway, that was pretty much where my stand was. I was anti-Vietnam War, wearing the uh, the black armbands on. Uh, uh, in uh, in the fall of '69, uh, during the the uh, against the Vietnam War and the moratorium and, and that, um, and the uh, and, and that sort of thing. So I was fairly radicalized, but 
the thing happened to me was like a lot of kids are, you know, they're conservative. They go to college and the college turns them into leftists. Well, it was just the opposite happened to me. I was, I was a, 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 a kind of a leftist going into college and came out uh, more of a libertarian. And so it was just, I would listen to this sort of leftist rhetoric from my college professors and thought, no, I, I don't think I believe that one bit, you know, I think, so that's what happened to me uh, mm -hmm. in, in the ensuing years. And uh, I never was really a, a hardcore conservative. I'm always more of a libertarian mm -hmm. than that. So, but because I, and, but I am definitely anti-left, if I may say so. Mm -hmm. And this was at uh, Cal State Fullerton? Uh, originally mm -hmm. Fullerton, Jun Fullerton JC, Fullerton Junior College, and then Cal okay. State Fullerton, where I graduated in 76. All right. With a degree in English? Degree in English, yes. Okay. So you became de-radicalized? <laughs> became your... de-radicalized in college. Yeah. yeah, yeah which is, uh, like you say, it, it's an inversion yeah. uh, of what was uh, the typical uh, yeah. schematic for, for kids our age that were going through college. Right. Now, how would you, from um, your perspective, and, and you have the, uh, a, a son, right? A, a child. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's uh, my son uh, launched 32. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also graduated Cal State Fullerton. Uh, he graduated, I believe, in 2012 mm -hmm. uh, in, with a business degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was, speaking of, you know, events that changed somebody, he was more or less roughly um, liberal in his sensibilities uh, with libertarian edge. And what changed him and made him uh, change was the Kavanaugh hearings of just a couple of years ago. Huh. He's, he saw what was going on and all of a sudden it just, and now of course he won't talk about anything else but politics. And I'm trying to steer him towards, can we talk about music? Can we talk about <laughs> film? Can we talk about literature? And it's so sure we can. And then of course it turns right back around to politics. So he's really intense about that right now mm -hmm. uh, as a, uh, uh, you know, with regards to the political situation and anti-left. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, what I've been able to, uh, you know, I haven't lived in Orange County for, for many, many years, but sure. I have seen it from our time when we were kids, mm -hmm. when we were little kids, uh, has, has drifted uh, firmly into the, um, into the blue category. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Orange County? It's no uh, longer I the think Orange Curtain. I think we're purple. I think purple. Purple. there's a lot of lot of red in there a lot of uh, blue in there but we're still there's a lot of red as well uh in fact we just re-elected uh she came back in after a two-year layoff uh young kim who is our u.s representative she mm -hmm. had been a young representative there was some suspicious activity which got gil cisneros in there for two years where uh she was uh said the likely winner and then all of a sudden uh, sufficient number of ballots to Yet Cisneros elected Dawson turned up all at once. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's back in office. Uh, she will be back rather to, after the first of the year. So, and she's a Republican and a very conservative Republican. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, and it's, so it's, and I think in the South County, there's another, uh, her name is Lee. And she's, a, I think, another uh, in South County, which tends to be more conservative anyway. And she's also a representative, US representative from Orange County. So at least two of our representatives in this county, which is the sixth most populous county in the country. Mm -hmm. um, are uh, are Republicans, so it's not entirely uh, uh, red, uh, 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 blue here. So just on your guess, and I know the election is still up in the air, but but sure. in your your district, which as you mentioned, was a, is a really important one nationally. Yeah, because of its population base. Yeah, do you still think it 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 leans towards uh, Trump and Republican? Uh, yeah, I do think it probably does, but I, I can't say for certain because it's kind of hard to tell with pollsters and and right, uh, right. election results. Um, it'd be kind of hard to say because, you know, you you drive down some streets and they've got their, um, uh, like my wife, Leslie, uh, walks because she can't get into the gym these days. So she walks up our street, Acacia, which actually goes up into a, a hill area north of us. And she'll walk down the street and there'll be Trump banners and Trump signs here. And and then occasionally you'll find somebody with a who would have a Biden uh thing on their thing so it's kind of hard to say just i mean that's her personal poll she mm -hmm. tends to think that at least on up acacia people tend to be would tend to be more for trump than for for the democrats mm -hmm. okay now let's go back to the uh 1963 life yes. uh, gets uh normal again on, on a on a personal level what was your evolution where did where did you go because i remember as kids we were all even though we couldn't vote, we were for either yeah. such as that, you know, it could be Nixon, it could be JFK. And we, we weren't 
anywhere nearly eligible to vote, but there was just sort of a, an excitement amongst the kids. What, what was it for you? Know, you, know, you in the, yeah, in the, in the election year 64, I remember you know, my dad was, because of his antipathy towards Johnson was firmly for Goldwater. Uh, and and uh, there was a, um, I mean, we had the book, the Phyllis Schlafly book, A Choice Not a Nickel was in our home. And, and I remember at Knott's Berry Farm, which was just practically right across the street from where I was living in Buena Park, uh, there was a big rally for Goldwater um, uh, there in, in this field near the, near the park at, at, uh, that I guess they allowed the Republicans to have. So I went over there and I, I made up a little sign that says AUH2O, which is, you know, a scientific term for gold and water. And that was one of his, his, um, his memes at the time. And I don't think the word meme existed then, but that's what it was. And so I, I made a little post at AUH2 and I'm walking around and, and uh, some guy came up, we've got this boy here who's got this sign that says AUH2O. Says, yeah, I'm for Goldwater. And then uh, the vice presidential candidate uh, Miller showed up and he kind of waved to the crowd. And uh, and then there was a <laughs> funny memory. I had little kids said, wow, you're interested in science too. I said, no, I'm more interested in language, but I like the, you know, so anyway. Uh, but as the year uh, got on close, close to the election, and I, and it looked to me like Goldwater was going to lose. I thought, well, I want, I want to be on the winning side. So I started wearing a Johnson badge around, partially to annoy my dad, and partially just because I thought, well, it'd be cool to be for Johnson. And then, of course, the election was a landslide. And then uh, I remember this joke from that period uh, right after I, this, maybe a couple years later. My friends told me if I vote for Goldwater, thousands of boys would die in Vietnam. So I voted for Goldwater, and they were right. Oh, wow. That's kind of uh, macabre, I would say. Yeah, it was indeed. But yeah, yeah, it's because, yeah, they already said that Johnson, that Goldwater was going to get us involved in a really nasty, deadly war in Vietnam. And of course, Johnson it was the one who, who, did, who did that. Oh, my God. Yes. But on that theme, then, Howard, yeah. can you describe that landmark national ad campaign that yeah. really threw, you know what I'm alluding to, right? I do indeed. Fill it out for us, please. Okay. Detail. This was a, a in Howard Wilson ad. style detail. Yes, a television ad showed a little girl, uh, probably about three or four years old, plucking the petals off a daisy, uh, and uh, he loves me, he loves me not. I believe was the thing, and while she's or she's counting, I'm not exactly remember exactly what it was, but she was plucking these petals off a daisy, uh, and then all of a sudden you hear ten, nine, eight, seven, six, etc., down to zero. All of a sudden you see this big mushroom cloud. And then they say voting for Johnson. Then they says vote for Johnson. Essentially, what they were saying was that if you vote for Gold, if Goldwater becomes president, the whole world will end in, in a devastating nuclear war because he's a he's an insane warmonger. Was essentially was the message of that ad. Yeah, and it was just horrible, absolutely horrible. And and, uh, and got, we got a lot of criticism for it. We as children were subjected to that. Yes. Uh, regularly, maybe hourly. That was a huge campaign. And I remember my parents uh, looking at it and, and they were horrified because there was, and, and hope you can help us understand here, Howard, also, sure. we were coming out of a, a nuclear Holocaust culture in school. Can you describe to the yeah, viewers here what that be, was like? Yeah, we would watch these uh, films on, uh, uh, they bring the camera, the, the, um, movie camera and we watch these films on what you're supposed to do in case of a nuclear attack duck and cover you know if you're walking down the street and all of a sudden you see the the flash or you hear the siren you get down on your hands and knees or get down on fall down on your face put your hands over your mouth and to make sure that you don't breathe in any fallout <clears throat> or you go to your fallout shelter if you had one uh and and occasionally there would be duck and cover drills at school you had fire drills and you'd go walk outside until the all clear bell rang. You come back in, and then we had duck and cover drills, where we would uh, get assume the position under our desks. And so, and, and just a, about maybe just a year before the assassination, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis, which um, was the, this was a, a confrontation between uh, Khrushchev and Kennedy over putting missiles bases in Cuba, just ninety miles off the coast of Florida. Uh, and it came to a, close to a real serious problem because uh, we had to blockade Cuba and finally uh, Khrushchev and the, and the Russians decided well, it was not going to be worth it. And so they turned it the way later and then just waited a few years and then they put them into Cuba when we weren't looking. But, <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but anyway, getting back to that, there was, and I remember my parents being really scared about that and kind of imparting that fear to us where I had nightmares about, about the whole world blowing up. But for instance, um, right around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was this gorgeous sunset. My mom looked out the window and all of a sudden she went into a panic because she thought the, the beautiful sunset was, uh, you know, the remnants of a mushroom cloud and we were all going to die. And my dad's saying, well, if there is a thing, I'm just going to drive over to the um, Seal Beach uh, Army Depot, you know, or the, uh, you know, weapons depot, and just wait, because that's one of the targets, because I'll just be hit right away, and then it'll be all over for me. So, but yeah, there was that mood and the fear of the, uh, the nuclear holocaust that we were all living under at that time, which started to fade a little bit, uh, yeah. as it, uh, you know, appeared there would be just plain old wars going on because of the, the nuclear mm -hmm. weapons. Well, that is so eerily reminiscent of what was going on with my parents. My mother was freaked out. She was scared. But, you know, I'm talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Sure. And everybody thought it was the end with capital letters. Mm -hmm. There was this apocalyptic dread. And we lived through this. Now, yeah. do you, And, and uh, there are some people, and I, I'm one of them, I, I would have to admit, uh, believe that most of that was a psyops. It was kind of like, you know, the War of the Worlds. They, every couple decades just to remind the popular and keep them in fear there has yeah. to be a psyops and ours was a tv psyops it was it was done through the television instead of a newsreel yeah. or a film um any other psyops beyond that one that to me was was the was the big one of uh probably the major one of existential dread since that time there because there was the assassination of robert kennedy there was assassination of martin luther king jr there was assassination of uh, malcolm x there was just a whole succession yeah. of these events that yeah. we lived through and experienced right We're trying to assimilate Plus, them as children yeah not to mention the manson uh, murders right around that time and then the this the, the cultural impact of woodstock uh, at the same time, and you know, and the whole the whole hippie movement, hate Ashbury, all these things were going on at the same time, and it was like the world was was turning over, in a lot of ways. Uh, you had uh, the the cultural getting more uh, frank about sex, if frank or just obsessed with it, with um, you know the 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 new uh, movie code with the GMRX ratings, uh, just all kinds of things were happening. Just the where everything had been seemed to be a steady state since the, the end of world war ii all of a sudden things were just turning over again and it was a huge and my parents were just like you know uh saying you know the the thing about long hair with guys too that you know getting yelled at by my dad because my hair was long <laughs> and of course 50 years later my son looks at me and says dad your hair's getting long you need a haircut and i said gee that's what your grandpa was telling me back in 1970 so but uh yeah, and we were going through that, and and um, and then the drug culture too was all involved in this. So these are back in that in the, and this all seemed to be to stem from, if not the Kennedy assassination, then maybe, uh, yeah, not necessarily the missile crisis that came and went. We had the dread, but yeah, the Kennedy assassination was the beginning of all kinds of just major changes in everything. Beatles, the hippies. Uh, loosening of moral, uh, you know, restrictions on in film and media. Uh, yeah, all that kind of stuff was just all happening in the in the time that, that we're talking. Well, Howard, that's an incredible assessment. That's a brilliant analysis, and it really Thank harkens you. true to your early fascination as a child with history and and what what its implications are and your 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 memory your your detail is uh incredible and uh, i'm really yeah. glad to have been able to interview you i hope that that perhaps you, yourself will uh it's sort of like a chain letter a productive one can start interviewing other quote-unquote boomers sure this type of information because we're being written out of the historical narrative as we speak and i yeah. don't want that I, I want to preserve these moments these these memories, important ones, political, cultural, personal, individual, uh, and familial that you have shared with us today. I thank you for that. And uh, hopefully welcome. you will consent to, uh, I invite you to be return guest at a later time. Oh, and talk, I'd and be happy to. Talk it's, it's good to see you again, Daryl. It's been too long. Same here, Howard. Thank you very much.